Welcome back. You're watching Stock Watch with me, Zinati Kuma. And joining me to unpack your stock-related questions tonight are Mark Detoy from Oyster Catcher Investments and Nick Krell from FNB Wealth and Investments. Be sure to send your questions via email to stockwatch at bdtv.co.za or via SMS on 41392 or on X at Business Day TV using the hashtag Stockwatch. Thanks so much for your time, gents. I'm quite surprised by how the JSC ended off today uh, because it started off in green territory. And of course, this is uh, after the uh, Asian markets came out higher. Um, we did see that upbeat Chinese data, retail sales, industrial production, even fixed asset management, uh, surprising it to the upside for the first two months of the year. Uh, but Mark, the JSC ending up in the red, even the rand um, weakening to just under 19 rand against the US dollar. What, what, what happened here? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, we've been getting a lot of um, uh, rate decisions this week, ECB and the Fed, although, I mean, most of the um, expectation is for them to be left on hold. So there might be a little bit of nervousness going into that. And we also saw the PGM counters coming under pressure again today with the metal prices down and the counters down. Um, but yeah, I also had the index rebalance on Friday. So there's a bit of left over and a rebalancing is still happening today so yeah a very kind of jittery market overall today yeah well actually uh, just talking about uh those resource counters uh, mark mentioned the pgms came under pressure it was quite a, a, a divergence that we saw there in that resource uh complex we had the pgms and even the the, the gold counters down but really we had exaro up uh, almost nine percent all the coal counters the tungela uh, Nick, was there anything to note in terms of the divergence within that resource sector today? Not really. I think a lot of it is um, <clears throat> also just following from moves that happened towards the end of last week. You know, so uh, PGM's up significantly towards the end of last week uh, and taking a bit of a breather today. I mean, you know, as Mark has mentioned, I think these markets are very jittery at the moment. So we haven't really got clarity as to where we're going. So we're waiting for more data. And depending on what data set comes out, um, it could move the market one way or the other. And every day we're seeing almost some, you know, interesting but outsized moves, but they don't really continue with momentum. You know, so we'll watch the PGM counters go up strongly for two days or for recovery and then take a breather. Um, and the, the moves are pretty, pretty big on a daily basis. I think you've just got to try and look beyond the noise. Unfortunately, everyone's trying to get some sort of idea as to where the world is going and markets are going, uh, economics are going, um, you know, nine to 12 months out from here. Mm. And actually just on that, um, the coal counters, Exaro, um, Tungela. Uh, Mark, was that, uh, you know, something to do with the coal price or the Tungela results that were out today? Yeah, so I mean, I think what was positive... Um, Tungela did have a nice set of results today. Also announced a share buyback program, which I think was unexpected and well received by the market. Um, in Zara's case, they announced a special dividend last week, so that was also well received. And also the iron ore price, um, which was below 100 last week, is now back above 100, 103 uh, dollars per ton. So, yeah, I think uh, incrementally positive news for 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 the iron ore um, counters, and then also on top of that, Tungela having um, a good result, and then also you know sticking to their their stated objective of uh, returning capital to shareholders in the you know according to their dividend um, uh, policy, and I think the market is starting to trust what is a relatively new company to the JSE to trust the management team to kind of follow through on 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 what they say. Um, and when times are good and they're making good cash returns to return some of that to shareholders. Ah, um, actually, just sticking with you, uh, Mark, you say a good result because we did see headline earnings per share declining more than 73%. Is it good result in terms of in this kind of environment or? <laughs> yeah, in terms of operational results. Okay. Um, and then also outlook. The, the main driver of the decrease in earnings was the reduction in the coal price. And so, you know, a company like Tungela doesn't have any control of, over what the coal price is, and they will sell coal at the best price that they can get. But if the market is down, obviously their, their revenue will be down. Um, but yeah, you know, they made a, a nice acquisition of Encham a coal mining company in Australia, and uh, they've able, able, been able to get some operational efficiencies out of it. 
and um, guiding to an increased um, production over the next year and you know the run rate's increasing over the year as well um, so yeah I mean as long as the coal price can hang around at these levels I think that they will continue to generate cash but they are highly leveraged to to the coal price so any kind of hiccup if it goes, coal price is low it's really bad for them if the coal price goes up from here then they they leverage to that coal price and they will do well Ah, all right. Well, something that uh, was interesting that they said is that, I mean, with this diversification uh, in geographies, that they want to capitalize on uh, the, the long-term good fundamentals of the uh, coal market. Uh, of course, that's not something uh, that a lot of people uh, would think that they would hear at this point, considering where the world is going. Uh, Nick, what do you make of that statement, but also the prospects for Tungela? Yeah, I think... Um you know, it's, it's all relative to time, right? So, so, so that is the factor. Um, we know over a period of time, uh, ultimately, utilizing coal, uh, you know, to generate energy and all those sorts of things has carbon emissions, etc. Not great for the environment. We'd like to transition off it. However, it's going to take time to do that. Um, you know, and we've certainly seen, I think, um, you know, with a lot of Europe trying to change very quickly a couple of years ago they're they're sort of making significant energy transitions and then realizing wow it's actually not possible this is going to take a lot longer it's a lot more difficult for us to actually to do uh, and in that sort of environment yes coal is perhaps not the the investment that you want you know looking 40 years out i think demand will be significantly less but if you have good assets um over a period of time and manage and run that company well um you know you've still got significant opportunity um, over the, the the short to the medium term um, and you know generate a lot of cash flows return that to shareholders uh, you've certainly got some sort of um, investment fundamentals I think um, you know a relatively compelling investment case ah, all right well let's go into some of the questions that we have gotten from our viewers today uh, starting off with the star Dio I'm gonna stick with you Nick because Mark did mention that Stadio is his stock pick <laughs> off air. So it's fine. I'll let Mark shine at the end of the show. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, the question goes, Stadio released a pretty good results with performance going in the right direction. However, the stock price is going in the opposite direction. Any thoughts on uh, this one? Uh, and is it a buy at current levels with a long-term view? Mark does seem to think that it is a good buy. On your side, Nick, uh, firstly, the divergence in the performance and the share price, but also if you would be going into the stock at the point i think my worry is less operationally about what the the, the stock is how it's performing uh, and a short to medium term i suppose um where i think the the results are pretty 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 good and it's you know a well-run uh, well executed sort of stock um but my longer term kind of concern is we certainly know that there's you know it's an ever-evolving space um and so that's the risk you don't really have certainty we know there's going to be demand but we don't know certainty, you know, with AI, all these sorts of things, how longer term uh, sort of tertiary education is going to roll out, uh, what business models are going to be profitable, um, you know, just what models are going to work. Um, I think there's a lot of uncertainty in that sector. And I think, it's, you know, it takes a relatively brave man to to invest in that sort of macro environment with regards to the sector. Um, you know, certainly we've seen with um you know, Kuro years ago, we, we knew that there was going to be a, be a demand. Um, unfortunately, the share price is significantly lower than where it sort of peaked. And why? Because, you know, it's a, it's a tougher environment. It's an ever-evolving type of environment. And we've also seen it with a lot of online education companies as well. Again, good demand. But where is this company going to be? What is the outlook going to be in three to five years' time? You're just not certain. Um, and in that sort of environment, I think... I'd rather wait uh, and, and kind of see how, how things, uh, you know, work out. Or alternatively, if I think it's um, incredibly cheap, uh, then I'll sort of dip my toes in. Uh, but I think there's a lot of work, you know, a lot of evolution in that sort of business model uh, potentially going forward. Uh, Mark, you'll get your right of reply in about 15 minutes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's go into Sasol. There are two questions on Sasol. Um, the Brent price has gone up today. Uh, Rand has gone up against the dollar. Yet uh, even this indicator news doesn't carry favor for Sasol's share price. Uh, there's also another question. The oil price has broken out, trading over 86 uh, dollars a barrel since it broke over 80 dollars. Uh, Sasol has just declined. So what on earth? 
will uh, well, when will the uh, stock get going? Um, is it time to sell or rather invest in a winner? What is going on? Will it reverse its downtrend? Let's actually talk about just that correlation between uh, the oil price and Cecil. Of course, there's been uh, quite a lot of debate on that as to why sometimes it does not correlate, but sometimes it does. Uh, Mark, your thoughts on that correlation? Yeah, so, well, in the past, Cecil was really all about the, the Rand oil price. Um, then remember they went and diversified their business and built a, a big chemical plant in the US, the Lake Charles uh, Cracker. And that really uses uh, ethane as, as its input and it manufactures chemicals for either the base chemical market or the performance chemical market. So Cecil now has exposure to the chemical um, industry or in chemical markets. Um, and they've got a lot of US dollar debt. So they're making US dollar uh, earnings from their cracker and they have to pay down the US dollar debt. So I think that the, the story around Sasol has changed quite a bit. They need chemical prices now to go up so that they can generate more dollars to pay down their debt. The South African business, the Secunda business is doing incredibly well with these high um, oil prices and the weaker rand. So they're making a lot of rands in South Africa, but they're also having, having to invest a lot of that money to try and um, make the Secunda process uh, less carbon intensive. Um, so a lot of the money that they make in South Africa, they're having to reinvest. It's, it's very capital intensive at this point. And then the longer term future of Secunda is a little bit less certain because it is a dirty progress uh, process. They use coal to, to uh, as their input. And um, there isn't really a, a real alternative other than other than coal at this point. So I think that's why, you know, the market is a little bit confused as to Sassel now. You make good money in Rand, but you have to reinvest mm -hmm. it. And then the chemical price, the chemical market hasn't done much. And it looks like there's a bit of an oversupply. And so the market's a bit confused as to what to do with Sassel now. Yeah, you make money and then spend it. Uh, Nick, at this point, uh, a course of action, will it reverse its downtrend? Uh, and or is it time to sell and rather invest in something else? Well, I mean, it's it's quite interesting. We've uh, I've, I've fielded a couple of these questions, um, and from every viewer, it's it's not. I'm I'm a sort of I don't have any exposure to Sassel. It's looking cheap. Should I buy? It's mm. I followed this down. I really want to sell, but I'm hoping for a bounce to sell yeah. out. And I, th I think that says a lot about the share price. Uh, very few sort of virgin buyers out there, and more a lot of people that just want to sell just not at these cheap prices. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it's demand and supply, and there's certainly enough supply and not enough demand. It's going to be a, a tough battle, I think, for that Sassel, Sassel share price. Um, fundamentally, it is cheap, and I do think that, um, you know, before this business goes un under, uh, as, as it were, I think they, they will have a time to sort of um, shine in the sun. Um, and in that sort of environment, is that's probably your opportunity to sort of have a look at reducing exposure. To do so now, uh, you might look really good in the short term, but I think, uh, you know, with a two, three year sort of hat on, you'll have found a much better opportunity later on to exit should you wish to do so. Uh, you know, Mark did say it faces significant challenges. It is a changed business. Um, and I think there's a lot of uncertainty with regards to that uh, and, and a lot of... Um, yeah, just general apathy, I, I think, around the stock, the stock performance um, and just not enough demand for the shares uh, mm. at the moment. But it, it does look cheap and I, I'm certainly hopeful that, uh, you know, there will be a better opportunity to exit, not right now. Uh, let's go into Orion. Uh, I have a few mining companies in my portfolio and would really like the panel's opinion on Orion Minerals. I've been watching the stock for months and the earnings report came out recently and my instincts only say buy. Um, does the panel agree on a two to three year hold if everything plays out right and the company begins its copper sales uh, journey in 2025? I don't know how much uh, you guys know about Orion. Um, Mark, any comments on that? Uh, I don't know Orion Minerals that closely, but I mean, we are bullish on the copper price. We've started to see now the copper price move up in recent, in recent weeks or recent days, actually. And um, the fundamentals for the copper market look good. So there's um, a lot of demand and not enough supply coming to market. And 
if interest rates come down and it's looking like it might be a little bit later in this year than what everyone thought, then um, it's good for economic activity and for the rollout of infrastructure. And as the, the, the energy transition um, takes place, we have to roll out a lot more infrastructure in the, in the electrical space. So that's very copper intensive. Um, electric vehicles are very copper intensive. So very bullish for, for the demand side. And then the supply, I mean, the mines are there and they're producing as best they can, but it's more and more difficult to get um, permission, environmental permission, uh, mining rights, and new mines are difficult to, to start up. So the supply will take longer to catch up if the demand starts to run further. So bullish copper price um, will be good for around minerals, but as to the exact specifics of the company, I, I can't say whether it's, yeah. a, it's a hold or a yeah, indeed, I have noticed that a lot of analysts don't really look at like the exploration companies like early stage mining companies, including uh, Copper 360, uh, which is just copper on the JC that listed um, last year. Um, Nick, would you agree with this? And maybe like if you're looking at copper, then you're looking at the, the, bi the bigger players, the bigger diversified players that do have copper exposure. Yeah, so I think, I mean, there's a couple of things. Uh, I, I think analyst ability to predict at a certain point in time exactly where these commodity prices are going to be has been shown to be pretty useless over <laughs> over time. Um, so you can talk about the general drivers. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly, I think the, the less of a sort of risky kind of way to venture into those markets at the right time is to go for the assets that are really hard to replicate. You know, some of the bigger, biggest and best type of um, sources that are out there. Um, and, and and rather play it that way, you will have a much less leveraged exposure than you would into, you know, an exploration type of company. But obviously, you know, in a market hit on one or two of those points there, you've always got further regulatory scrutiny, um, your ability to say, you know what, we're going to be producing in two years time or three years time and ramping up production in an environment at that point where the copper price is exactly what, or the commodity price is what, uh, you know, having a look at Tungela results again, We'd say they were operationally a good result, but as you said, earnings were down 60%. So there's a lot of, well, there's a lack of visibility in terms of exact amount of sort of cash flow and and earnings that are that are coming through in commodity companies. And so often we prefer to take sort of our exposure in your larger, better assets, where I think we have we feel like we have a bit of a, a safety cushion because of the quality the quality nature of the, those those assets. Oh, all right. Well, let's go into hospitality. There's a question on Sun International. Uh, can your uh, your panel's view on Sun International uh, that came out today with a divvy of uh, two rand three cents per share? Can we expect more good news by year end? Uh, yeah, it seems that like even today was good news. So I guess yeah, the question is, can this momentum carry on, Mark? Yeah, I think a, a nice set of results. I mean. A lot of people bought the, into the hospitality story as we were coming out of COVID and you know, capacity was returning and a lot of the companies had to restructure during the difficult COVID period. So I think that that kind of thesis is largely borne out now. Uh, we have seen capacity return and earnings return along with it. Um, and Sun International was a nice result. Um, I think that they will continue in this vein, but at sort of a, a slower pace going forward. So your, your share price appreciation might not be as steep. Um, but yeah, I mean, a decent company, a decent result. And um, I think if, if you own the share, you hold it. Uh, not particularly uh, cheap or doesn't kind of scream uh, real value to us. So we wouldn't be buying at this level. But I think, uh, you know, a decent, a decent counter to own. Yeah. Um Quite interestingly, um, I mean, they, they are acquiring Piemont. I, I think they, they yeah. That will probably be by the end of the year. There's still some uh, approvals that need to get through. Uh, but considering the fact that uh, Piermont has its own uh, debt that Sun International will have to take up, Nick, it seems that the markets aren't too bothered about that. Is it because there's a clear path on how to kind of handle that debt and how they're going to generate cash? Yeah, it would, it would look that way. And obviously, um, you know, any sort of gambling, I suppose, in, in general is, again, highly regulated in terms of the sites, what you can do, uh, the nature of the, the opportunity, right? So there's there's pretty significant moats around the industry as a whole. Um, however, we, we also know that it's, <laughs> again, the visibility is is, yeah. is, is pretty difficult. Um, 
and in hospitality as well. You know, it's a it's it's a tough business at the end of the day, and it's not a, a business where you just tick along and do very nicely year after year. You go through good times, you go through catastrophic times. The market changes. You've got to you know sell some some sort of exposure. You've got to you buy exposure in better areas. You've got to hope that you re- get a return on that capital over a shorter time frame because again the market can change. So you know overall it's a it's a business that uh, you know uh, or an industry that we probably not look that favorably upon. Um, mm. However, I think you know within that industry, from a Sun International perspective, it is it has done well. It has navigated COVID, I think, particularly well in a South African environment. And operationally, they have got some fantastic properties again, um, which uh, you know do very nicely for them. But uh, yeah, from here, a little bit less certain. You know, as mm. as Mark says, that recovery is kind of the easy 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 yards have been sort of attained, and now the question is where to and you know, is it just going to play out very, very nicely or a, a little bit slower? Uh, all right. Uh, uh, there's a question here on uh, the 10 year government bond. Uh, why has the 10 uh, year SA government bond yield increased by about one, uh, 800 basis points over the past week? Uh, Mark, any insights there? Yeah, we have seen uh, bond yields uh, rising. So people, well, the market's basically pricing our bonds lower. Um, we think it's it's to do with upcoming South African elections. There is nervousness going into the election. You know, our, our young democracy is gonna is evolving. Um, we're gonna see the ANC uh, most likely is getting a lower share of the vote than than prior. Um, we're entering into coalition politics. Um, so I think that there is increased uh, risk and uh, just kind of maybe a lack of buyers at the moment for South African bonds. Um, post the election, I think that we'll see a, a better. Uh, well, well, I think we're likely to see a rally in our in our bonds because, you know, there'll be certainty and we'll know where we stand. We'll know who the president is. We'll know what the coalition looks like if there's a coalition, and just the just the certainty going forward. Well, I think will will um, will lead to a better rating for for the South African bonds. Yeah. Um- I'm not going to bother Mark with this question on EOH. I think every time he's on, there's a question on EOH. <laughs> and I think he's tired of answering uh, about EOH. Uh, Nick, coming to you, EOH. Um, and I think, Nick, it, it also boils down to what you were saying about Cecil is that um, there are investors that have been in the stock and that maybe would like to get out, uh, but they can't at these kinds of lower prices. And so uh, the question is always, will it go back up again? And I guess that's uh, the question here. Should I hold for the next four to five years? Uh, will the share price rebound, EOH? Yes, yeah, so I think, um, you know, fundamentally there's, there's value. Uh, the big question is, you know, with any fantastic story, I think that share price peaked well over 100 rand now sitting where? Uh, new, we're close to that 100 rand level. Um, so in that sort of environment, you, you've been, um, you know, restructuring, doing a massive turnaround, trying to become profitable, exiting businesses with risk. I mean, it's been a very turbulent and tumultuous sort of time, I think, for EOH, uh, as well as for shareholders. Um, I think there's value that's there, but I think there's also a significant lack of confidence um, in that turnaround and when the timing is actually going to happen. So, you know, if you're holding it right now, it's a, it's a, it's a bit of pull to swallow. Um, I think a lot of that comes down to at what price you entered into and what you kind of thought about it at that point. Um, you know, you bought it at 100. Yeah, it's not making too much of a difference whether it triples from here or not, you're going to be taking a bath when you exit. Um, mm. So use it for capital gains, to offset capital gains elsewhere. Um, I also think in this sort of macro environment, this lack of sort of certainty that we see on a global basis, but also in South Africa, uh, and we're seeing more and more companies that have run afoul of trying to do turnarounds in a weakened macro environment, um, you know, doing the hard yards in a business, uh, you know, restructuring things. uh, It's a really difficult environment to successfully execute that at the moment. So, you know, overall, let's talk about new money. I would and have been staying away from turnaround stories, even though there might be value. Uh, just because I think sure, there's a much higher chance than normal that things could go wrong um, in this type of uh, tougher macro environment and, and with the, the uncertainty that's out there. So, mm. yeah, that's my two cents. Yeah, indeed, it, it, it has been very tough because I even think in their last uh, update, uh, they did point to uh, still uh, loss-making 
uh, position, even though it has narrowed. So I guess the big question is, when will they start uh, making a profit? All right, let's go to your stock picks today, gents. Mark, we already know what yours is. Stadio, state your case. <laughs> yes, I'm picking Stadio tonight. I think they had a really nice result today, earnings up 23%. Uh, student numbers growing 10% to 46,000 students. I think that they've really delivered on, on the longer term um, story that they've been talking about. They are on track to beat their uh, forecast of 56,000 learners by 2026. And I think that there's still a lot of runway left in this business. Um, the next kind of target is 100,000 students and they want to have 80% distance learners and 20% contact learners. And I think that the earnings can continue to grow at above 20% for, for at least the next five years. And in South Africa, we don't have a lot of good growth stories out there. I think this is one. And um, yeah, I think it will just continue to deliver. So I'm a buyer of Stadio. Uh, before we go to Nick, are you not bothered by the, the, the pressure that we have seen on the, the share price or are you just thinking about it as just an opportunity to get into the stock, Mark? Yeah, the share price um, underperformance today was was surprising because there weren't uh, good numbers. Um, we have seen a, quite a few. Well, we saw a number of other small cap stocks come under pressure today. So perhaps you know there was a there was a, a theme uh, that was playing out today. It didn't look like it was stock specific to to Stadio. Um, yeah, so I would I would use this as a buying opportunity. Um, I can't see anything in the near term to to derail their progress. Yeah, I think it's a good opportunity. Uh, all right. Where are you seeing opportunity today, Nick? In China. <laughs> That's uh, the easy, quick answer. Uh, my uh, stock pick for this evening is Tencent. Um, obviously, we get a lot of investment here from a process Nuspers kind of exposure. And I think we certainly know the, the troubles, um, both from a macro kind of perspective, uh, as well as from a geopolitical perspective uh, and regulatory perspective that uh, Chinese stocks in general have faced. Uh, and Tencent certainly almost started that off. Um, however, I think operationally, these results should be pretty, pretty good pretty stellar kind of results and, and uh, I'm hoping with this uh, very mute valuation where we find ourselves at the moment that eventually the market starts looking through this and starts saying you know what even in these sort of tough environments look at the performance that's actually been generated look at the cash flow generated within the stock uh, the share buybacks that will kind of continue again um, you know now that they've sort of faced a, or closed you know post their closed kind of period uh, and I think there's probably an arguably a, a lot of momentum uh, for a stock like that uh, so yeah it'll I think manifest itself through Tencent, uh, but ultimately any South African holder of process and Nuspers will be a beneficiary as well. So I think there's good opportunity there at the moment. Ah, all right. Well, thank you so much for your time and for your analysis today, gents. Really appreciate it. That is all for tonight's Stock Watch. Thanks to our guest, Mark Dutoy from Oyster Catcher Investments and Nick Krell from FNB Wealth and Investments. Up next, the close. Stay watching. Mm -hmm.